with approximately 11,500 undergraduates and about 4,000 postgraduates attending Exeter University, many of whom are just starting their first year, is further education a necessity for young people today? Well, it's not a necessity, clearly, because quite a lot of young people still don't go into higher education and they need to be given uh, useful things to do and work which pays and skills that enable them to get that work. But in a global economy, it's going to be, in my view, be increasingly important that people are qualified up to degree level. Uh, we saw a big expansion in higher education under the Labour government. I worry that that's stalled under this government. It's becoming more difficult for people not least to be able to afford, but if we're going to compete with countries like South Korea and China and other countries that are coming up, uh, we're going to have to educate and, quali and qualify our, our workforce uh, better than we ever have and uh, you know, that will be good for them, good for their futures and good for their families. So you said that it's becoming more difficult for people to afford um, education these days. So you wouldn't agree with the government on their current stance with tuition fees? No, I mean the, the Liberal Democrats made a clear pledge at the last election. You may remember Nick Clegg travelled around the country with his Liberal Democrat MPs holding up placards saying uh, you know, we will abolish tuition fees and one of the first things the coalition did when it got into office was treble tu tuition fees. That was a direct deceit of the electorate and I think certainly from my experience in Exeter uh, talking not just to students but also parents of students they feel very angry and very let down uh, by that. Um, you know, clearly we have to fund higher education somehow and it's clearly in my view fair that there's a balance to be struck between uh, what we expect the taxpayer to fund and what we expect individual students and their families themselves to contribute given that they're the people who are likely to benefit from having a degree in education uh, but you know if we're trying to restore people's faith in politics, uh, making such a clear pledge like that and then breaking it almost at the earliest opportunity uh, was, you know, a very bad move in, in, in my view and, uh, you know, not just not being honest with people. If you had the power to change it, would you change the current uh, fee level? Yes, I would. I mean, I, I don't think there's any chance that we'll be able to go back down to the kind of levels that... Uh, that this, this current government inherited because that would have a huge impact on the funding of higher education. Uh, the current Labour policy is to reduce fees to £6,000 as an initial step, but I think we need to look at much more imaginative ways to make the funding of higher education fairer. But we also need to address very urgently uh, the trend that we've seen in the last three years of people from uh, middle and low income families being put off going into higher education because of fears of getting into debt. We saw big increases in not just the expansion of higher education under the last Labour government but more and more people from uh, modest uh, families with modest and low incomes coming into going to university and that has now gone into reverse and I think that's a terrible tragedy. Do you think aiming for 50% of young people in further education was a sensible policy? Yes, I do. I mean, if in South Korea it's 60-70%, in some of these other countries in Asia that we're going to have to compete with, and other continental European countries, it's even higher than that. Um, so I don't think there needs to be an arbitrary figure, but uh, before the last Labour government came in, we had the, one of the lowest rates of university education of any of any developed country. And as I was saying earlier, if we're to compete in the in the modern world in the future in a globalised economy, uh, we're only going to be able to compete. You know, we can either compete on low wages and bad conditions. I don't think that's what we or people want. Or we can compete on the basis of what we know, our knowledge and our skills. And uh, I think that's the future that most people would want to see. And in order to do that, we have to invest in education. We have to invest in our young people's future. Um, do you think that poorer students applying to university risk losing out in places to a middle class bias as Professor Les Ebden has recently warned? Well, he's the guy who should know because he's the man who's responsible uh, for making sure uh, that there is fair access uh, for people from less well-off backgrounds. I have to say I think Exeter University has done a great job under its current Vice-Chancellor over recent years in terms of expanding access uh, it spent a lot of money on bursaries for, for students and it's also encouraged more people from the local area to go to university. But we, we absolutely do have to keep an eye on, on this because it's always going to be tempting for uh, universities, uh, when they're cash strapped, uh, to focus on those students who they feel will bring in the most cash. And unless the government is prepared to put money and universities themselves put money into bursaries for students from uh, poor backgrounds, then we're going to see the progress that we've made in recent years go into reverse. 
Exeter has a bit of a reputation for having a quite large middle class population and student body. Do you think it still suffers from that? I, I, I think it may do, but I think there's a bit of a perception and time lag here. Um, I mean, there's no doubt that Exeter is a nice place to go and study. It's also quite a difficult university to get get into. It, you know, you need to have good A-levels and uh, it's, it's popular well. and it's a very expensive city uh, to live in relative. It's one of the, I think, the, one of the cities with the highest student uh, rents of anywhere in the country outside London. Um, but, I mean, compared with 20 or 30 years ago, when it definitely had a reputation as being a bit of a green welly university, that has changed. And certainly in, in the um, years that I've been Member of Parliament, I've seen a big change in the mix of the student body. And certainly uh, at Freshers' Fair every year when I go up, um, you know, you still uh, get quite a strong contingent of, um, you know, young people from well-off independent schools, but there's also a much, much bigger cross-section and also much more international uh, student body, given the success Exeter's had in, 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 in uh, attracting uh, overseas students, which again has helped it perform uh, as a university and raise money and boost the local economy. Do you think the higher education system can be reformed further to make it fairer and more accessible? Yes, I mean, I think there's a lot more that we could do to encourage people uh, who maybe haven't had the opportunity to study at university to do so later in life, uh, doing it part time uh, rather than, you know, it's very difficult for someone if they haven't done well at school and they go into the workforce and they want to upskill themselves later on in life. Uh, the university does a great job, but I think there's more we could do at local level to put on courses uh, for people to study part time. Um, and again, I think you know we're going to have to look very carefully at how how we fund higher education and how how people study uh, to, to ensure that it, it remains uh, accessible, remains affordable, but at the same time our universities remain competitive with some of the best universities in other parts of the world. You mentioned uh, international students. Do you think it's fair that they're possibly going to be charged up to £35,000 in comparison with the 9000 that British students pay? That's a fair price for their studies. Well, it, it's it difficult, isn't it? I do think that um, you know, if you're in a situation like Exeter University where you're wanting to ensure that, that British youngsters who've got the talent and ability can go to university and not worry about the cost and you want to provide bursaries and support for those people, and at the same time you're facing government cuts, one of the ways that you can raise income is from foreign students. And don't forget, a lot of those uh, foreign and overseas students will be coming on bursaries themselves from their home governments. So it's not just that uh, the foreign students who are at X University are only there because they come from super rich families, but a lot of them will be there on either government supported schemes or schemes supported by their employer. Um, so. You know, in an ideal world, uh, no, but uh, and I would worry, for example, if uh, we started to see a drop-off in the number of overseas students coming to Britain. Actually, we have under this government, but that's because of their immigration rules, not because of the level of fees that are charged. Thankfully, Exeter has managed to buck that trend, and Exeter is still attracting uh, an ever-increasing number of overseas students. Um, but it, it's, it's more the immigration rules, as they apply to students, that I would worry about than cost being a, t a deterrent effect here. And of course, international or home students, people have got to be finding jobs afterwards and there are quite possibly not enough graduate level jobs around. What steps would you take if, you, if it were up to you to reduce graduate unemployment? Well, I, I left university, um, I think, the t two Tory recessions ago in the, in the early 1980s, so I felt I, I, I faced similar problems and it's very tough. I am mean, much more tough now because students coming out of university uh, have also, you know, a lot of them um, built up quite quite significant debts. So I think the pressure on them is even greater than in a way than it was when I was uh, when I when I graduated. I think you know there's no simple answer to this, but clearly we have to have a growing economy that's producing the jobs uh, that graduates can then fill. Um, you know, we would we would reintroduce a very successful um, work program for young people, which the Labour government introduced when the financial crisis hit in 2008, uh, which a lot of graduates benefited from who were finding it difficult to get work, which gave them six months or a year uh, work experience, paid work experience in uh, in a field that they were interested in doing, and and in many cases that led that led to employment. But I mean, the most important thing is to get the economy growing and get a proper industrial strategy in place where we're investing. 
in those areas, you know, the environmental technologies, the creative industries, and, and so forth, are, which will provide the well-paid graduate jobs of the future. That's what governments need to do. So just continuing with the idea of unemployment, how can youth unemployment be resolved with an increasing number of needs, so those not in education, employment or training? Well, you're right, there's a particular problem at the moment. The number of uh, young people in long-term unemployment um, has trebled in the last three years. Uh, and yes, these are many of these people are people who don't have very good qualifications. Uh, they may come from families where there's a, a history of, of unemployment going back generations. And uh, governments basically have to focus laser-like on them and boosting their skills. Um, as I said a moment or two ago, we had a very good scheme under the Labour government, the Future Jobs Fund, which helped those young people get into training or work. I'm afraid that the current government's uh, uh, job creation scheme has been a dismal failure. It's hardly found anyone uh, sustainable employment. So you have to have a combination of things. You have to have an economy that's growing and, pr and creating the jobs uh, for people to do, but you also have to have an active government that's supporting uh, these young people to improve their skills so that they are employable uh, and cannot have something to offer uh, firms and companies both locally but across the country. Do you think young people are engaged in politics? And if yeah, are, I do. I've never bought this idea that young people these days are apathetic or they're cynical or they're turned off politics. To be perfectly honest, I remember when I was a young person and quite interested in politics, I was not very usual for my generation. You know, most, most of my contemporaries were off, off having fun and doing other things instead. I think it's always been a minority of young people at any given time who have been actively engaged in politics, but certainly whenever I go round schools in Exeter or go to the college or the university, I find uh, young people not only as engaged but actually much better informed and better educated than I think they've ever been. Um, young people don't necessarily always see uh, a vehicle for their political activism or, or idealism, if you like, through political parties. I think they often feel more comfortable in, you know, channeling their energy into charity work or, or single issue organisations. Uh, I think, again, that's a kind of natural progression and um, a lot of people come to party politics through you know, individual campaigns on the environment or on, uh, on you know, global poverty. Uh, but, you know, I think that's, that's always been the case. Um, but no, I certainly feel, uh, particularly now, because young people have been bearing the brunt of this government's austerity policies, that there's, a, there's a, if anything, a, re a renewed interest among young people in politics. And, um, you know, wanted to get involved and make a difference. Yeah, and there's been the streetlight campaign with the possibility of turning off streetlights at night throughout Exeter and obviously a lot of young people at university have been involved. What are your opinions on the possibility of turning off the lights? Well, I think the County Council, Devon County Council, which was responsible for streetlighting, needs to, needs to proceed very cautiously on this. And yes, the students have, uh, have run a very effective and I think justified campaign, not least given uh, you know, some uh, you know, unfortunate uh, incidents uh, on women uh, uh, after dark that have happened on campus and off campus. Uh, you know, good street lighting in areas where students are going to and fro late at night is really important, not just for their safety but also for their sense of well-being. And to be perfectly honest, I cannot see that by switching off street lights across Exeter, uh, the, the County Council is going to be saving an awful lot of money or an awful lot of carbon emissions. I can think of many, many <laughs> better ways in which they could, do, they could do that. So I hope they will listen to the concerns of students in Exeter and also actually listen to the concerns of, of, Exeter, of Exeter City Council, which is very worried about this, and certainly Exeter's Labour councillors have been campaigning very hard against the County Council uh, plans. Um, and I, you know, I, I wish the students campaign well. And of course another way you've been uh, getting people involved in politics is through your internship scheme. Has it been worthwhile? Can students expect to apply next year? Well it's certainly been worthwhile for me. Uh, maybe I've just been very lucky at the people who've come through the office but uh, I've been fortunate over the last two or three years to have had a series of very good ex university undergraduates um, coming to work in my office uh, here in Westminster but also uh, shadowing me down in the constituency giving them an idea of of you know, what MPs do and how kind of political system works, if you like. I think they found that a, a valuable and worthwhile experience. And it's always uh, nice for me to have, um, you know, 
young people coming through the office. We 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 tend to have uh, volunteers or interns on a pretty regular on a pretty regular basis, and they've always got something new to bring. Uh, uh, they they always bring a new and a fresh perspective to the office. And um, uh, you know we've we you know we've we've had a couple of quite good little local campaigns over the summer, thanks to the ingenuity and. Uh, um, uh, and hard work of the interns who've been in, in the office. So yeah, no, it's been great. Um, you've been Exeter's MP since winning the seat in the 1997 general election. What have been the biggest changes in Exeter in that time and what are you most proud of in your 16 years as MP? Well, there's been a lot of change in Exeter in that time. Um, I'm, I mean, just one example is all, all of our five high schools have been completely rebuilt from scratch. When we were elected in 97, the high schools in Exeter were not only actually underperforming quite badly in terms of their results but the buildings were completely dilapidated and uh, there was a massive investment uh, in new school buildings not just high schools but also primary schools. Um, the city has done pretty well uh, over those years we've attracted the meteorological office to relocate there from Bracknell uh, we uh, attracted uh, one of the first new medical schools to open in, in Britain since the 1960s, uh, which is doing very well, a new dental school. Uh, we've helped bring new investment into the city in retail and, and other businesses. And um, some of the partnerships that the university has formed with, with places like the Met Office have really boosted uh, local high tech and high skilled employment, which has been which has been great for the city. So we're we're much more successful now in holding on to our graduates than that we used to be. You know, Exeter used to lose a lot of its best and brightest graduates to London or Bristol, whereas now there are more interesting and um, you know uh, good, well paid jobs for them to do locally. Um, we've also got a flourishing arts scene. Uh, we were one of the first um, cycle demonstration cities under the last Labour government cycling scheme and we've seen a big increase in uh, cycle use and also children, uh, school children cycling to school. So all in all, it's been a, you know, it's been a, um, you know, a good 20 years for Exeter. I mean, the, the, of course the last few years have been quite difficult, but in spite of that, because of the work that's been done before and the fact that Exeter has a mixed economy and thanks to the university, I have to say, I mean, the university in the, in the depths of uh, the recession was a was like it was a one person economic stimulus because of all the building work that was going on at the university. Um, it al almost helped make it feel in Exeter as, as if there wasn't a crisis. So uh, the university has been incredibly important to Exeter's success and growth, and I'm sure will continue to be. So I mean, people often sort of don't realise this, but you know, um, higher education is is a vital part of of Britain's economic success and output and uh, uh, you know it should be seen in the same light as manufacturing or the pharmaceutical industry or the creative industry it's it's a provider of jobs it's a huge generator of income and Exeter's economy is uh, is very dependent on it so um, no we, we've had a we've had a good good few years and I'm sure we'll have good, many many good few good good years in future and what advice would you give to new students about the best places to see and the best things to do next time? <laughs> I don't really feel qualified to give advice to 18 year olds about what they should get up to in Exeter. I'm sure they'll have a, I'm sure their peers will be able to give them a lot lot, lot, lot more um, <laughs> lot more interest. I mean just make the most of make the most of your time in Exeter. It's a lovely city. Uh, there's lots going on culturally. Um, we've got a good little theatre scene. Uh, you know, we've got a decent smattering of bars and clubs, some very good pubs, um, some beautiful countryside around about if you get the opportunity to go out and go out and explore it and enjoy it. Um, and you know I hope you have a happy and um, successful uh, time in the city and who knows you may feel like settling here afterwards and making it your home. You'd be very welcome. And um, finally, if you could give one piece of advice to today's students with your miraculous gift of hindsight gleaned from your days as a student, what would it be? Well, I suppose everybody thinks this, don't they? But I, I, um, I think I probably spent too much time at university partying and not enough time applying myself to my course. Uh, but, you know, I did okay in the end and... Um, <laughs> And that social side was a very important side of university to me. But I sometimes think that 
if I'd gone to university a bit later or if I'd applied myself a bit earlier, I would have made more of the academic side. I mean, I enjoyed my, I, I enjoyed my degree, and um, particularly towards the end when I got into it more. But um, uh, so, you know, also, you know, don't forget that this is a, this is a great opportunity um, and you probably only get it once uh, to study a subject in, in, in real depth and, uh, you know, apply yourself, but at the same time, you know, you know uh, realise that there's more to life than just hard work and study. Great. Is that right? Yeah, thanks very Thank much. You very much.